Many thanks for the kind introduction and also many thanks for this uh, invitation to speak to you as a chemist, uh, not as a physicist. I have to say I got my degree in physical chemistry, so I'm, I'm a borderline case, <laughs> I would say. Uh, but, but actually, if you talk about energy problems, it doesn't really matter what your scientific discipline is, because energy on a global scale is a problem which is uh, tackled by physicists, by chemists, by economists, by psychologists. All sciences have to contribute to finally resolve uh, our, our energy problems and our energy future. And I have, th 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 there is also nothing like an energy scientist. So why am I qualified to talk about this? Well, I'm not really, I, I don't really know. I have worked from the chemistry side on many different topics, interconversion of small molecules, I've worked on batteries, I've worked on fuel cells, I've worked on hydrogen storage. If you do that, well, you get a glimpse of everything and then you read more. And I think it, it, it is in the energy sector is important to combine threads from very different directions uh, to get something like an overall picture. To answer the question you posed already now, it's a key. <laughs> There are many keys. There, there is not the simple single solution we have if we want to address energy questions. Storage is a key. But before I come to the storage question, I want to give you a rough overview to our energy system as it is and why we should, should change it. I mean, I have the saying in my lab, I'm sure many of you do the same, if it's not broken, don't fix it. We have light, it's warm here, we drove here by car, by train, by plane, whatever. So what's the problem? We have an energy system which is functioning. Why should we worry about changing it? Well, we do have climate change, and there are many indicators of climate change. This is maybe uh, <laughs> one which is not totally scientific. <laughs> Here is the more scientific indicator for climate change. This is from the IPCC report, from the last release of the IPCC report. This is average global surface temperature projected until the end of the century for different scenarios how the world would develop. And you see, this is a scenario which for my feeling is totally unrealistic. We will not be able to maintain this scenario. This basically means we would need to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, stop basically any more emissions. This is an unrealistic scenario. The scenarios here are calculated for different growth trajectories for the economy, efforts to mitigate uh, or, or reduce CO2 emissions, uh, development of global population and so on. All these scenarios agree that the global average temperature will increase by the end of this century by something between, let's say, one and a half, uh, up to four. There are even more severe scenarios, up to six centigrades. We have the two-degree goal, which is publicly stated. So we should reduce or should restrict the, the global average temperature increase to two degrees. This is, of course, a communication goal uh, because you need to have one value where you say, well, if we keep it here, it's not dangerous. If it's higher, it's dangerous. If it's lower, we are okay. As scientists, we know if it's 1.98, well, it will not be totally okay. And if it's 2.02, .02, it will not be a disaster. But uh, it, it's good to have these clear statements uh, when you communicate. And two degrees seems to be something which is still manageable. Now, uh, our, our energy systems, and I say systems because we don't have the same system everywhere, is changing dramatically. CO2, which was just something which we could emit into the atmosphere for free, now has a price, at least in some sectors, the power plant sector. They have to pay when they emit CO2. The target price when emission certificates in the European Union were set was 40 euros. Currently, it's around 20, 25 euros. It has been down to five euros, actually, per ton of CO2 emitted, and it's a trading system. We will have an increasing share of electricity in the system, which is caused by the fact that most renewables come in as electrical energy. 
and by the fact that heating, which is typically not done electrically, is reduced because we have better insulation. So that, that means what, what is not done by, by fossil resources will uh, not contribute to overall consumption. We have very strong fluctuations in oil prices, which we partly see reflected at the gas station. And this is something where, where energy science borders into politics, law, economies. We have uncertain and rapidly changing boundary conditions. Uh, we, we have laws which are passed, and then when there is a new government, they are changed back to the previous situation and so on. This is very difficult if you make investment decisions. And investment decisions in the energy systems are long-lasting decisions. So this is a, is a tricky situation. Let's have a look at the global energy consumption. And I show this because it's essentially energy consumption is three different sectors painted with a very broad brush. We have oil, oops, sorry, we have oil, that's the mobility sector, essentially. We have gas and a bit coal and others, which are the heating sector. And then we have here coal, nuclear, hydro, part of uh, renewables, which is the electricity sector. Very roughly, they're all about a third. A third mobility, a third heating, a third electricity. Which on the other hand means if we only address one sector of the energy system, currently situation, the, the discussion is focused very strongly on electricity, we won't solve the CO2 problem. We have to address all three sectors because essentially they contribute equally. Overall, this was 2018, that's the, the last number I got, 586 exajoule. Exa means 10 to the 18. I didn't worry about these uh, prefixes before I worried about uh, energy questions, so I never encountered exa before. So that, that, that's the global energy demand projected to increase to uh, 10 to the uh, to, to to about 900 exajoule by 2050. Now, the German energy situation looks very similar. One third roughly oil, mobility. One third heating, gas, some renewables, some coal. And one third in the electricity sector. Overall, 12.9 exajoule, which on the other hand also tells you if we change anything in Germany, this is 12.9 compared to 589, this won't save the world. But of course we have to do something to set an example, to develop technology, to be also a test ground for new technologies. And actually advances in one country can lead to changes in many other countries. I have a colleague who was the head of research at, at uh, RWE, one of our electricity suppliers. He said the German photovoltaics feed-in tariffs were a gift to the world because they were partly responsible that the prices for solar cells dropped dramatically and now we don't necessarily profit, but power plants all around the world become competitive if they use photovoltaic solar cells. And so changes in one country can have a different, can make a difference on the global scale. Now this is roughly the scenario. We cover our energy needs basically by burning fossil fuels. And if you burn fossil fuels, you leave a CO2 footprint because most of the fossil fuels are based on carbon or hydrocarbons. I just wrote for three different examples just that you, that you see in a nutshell how much carbon dioxide we generate. This is essentially coal. Coal is more or less C. It's not totally correct, but coal is more or less C. This is liquid hydrocarbons, this is oil, and this is gas. And if we oxidize that, we oxidize the C to CO2, and we oxidize the H to H2O, to water. And both reactions contribute to the energy gain we get from these reactions, which means the more C you have in your molecule, the more CO2 you generate, and the bigger your carbon dioxide footprint is. And it's actually a pretty big one. If we look here, hard coal, hard coal power plant, 38% efficiency, which is moderate. We emit a kilogram of CO2 per kilowatt hour generated. That's quite a lot, a kilogram of CO2. A car 
emits on the order of 150, 200 grams per kilometer driven. That's substantial amounts of CO2 we are emitting. But if we have fossil fuels, well then, natural gas at least is the best one because there is a lot of H in the molecule which forms water upon combustion and not carbon dioxide. So if we, if we use fossil fuels, well, we should use as much as possible natural gas and little coal to reduce our CO2 footprint. But of course, it would be much better not to use fossil fuels at all, but change to a renewable system. And in a renewable system, in principle, we have plenty of energy. This is, a, I think, a very illustrative uh, calculation which originally came from Ludwig Bölko uh, Systems Technology. They have made a very rough calculation. They said, well, the Sahara day at sunshine, sunshine at noon gets about a kilowatt of power per square meter. That's roughly the solar irradiation hitting the Sahara surface. Which means we need 100 square meters of Sahara to generate 5 kilowatts if we take into account that there is day and night. And if we take into account we have a conversion efficiency of only 10%, which is bad. Solar cells are currently commercial cells at about 20%. So this is a very pessimistic assumption. But let's stick with this assumption. Five kilowatt is an interesting number. That's the power consumption of the average Central European. So me, you, 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 all of us have an average power consumption of five kilowatts for our living, which is a lot. If you have sit on an ergo machine recently, you, can, you have the reading how much you can pedal. If you're really good, you may be able to do 200 watts for an hour, but then you're already in pretty good shape. We need five kilowatts. So the, the rest needs to come from, I always say we need 50 energy slaves which are pedaling for us to, to, to cope with our energy needs. Of course, this is basically coal, hydrocarbons, and so on, which we are using to come up with the 4.9 kilowatts which we cannot generate ourselves. So we need each person in Central Europe needs 100 square meters, which means we need 700,000 square meters of desert area to lift 7 billion people, global population, to the energy standard of the Central European. Well, some have actually are not lifted. They are set down a bit, those who use more than the 5 kilowatts. But, but we are not living in an uncomfortable situation. So 5 kilowatts doesn't look bad. So 700 square meter, kilometers of desert area twice the size of Germany. We need this amount of desert area for Germany, this amount of desert area for the EU, this amount of desert area for the world at realistic conversion efficiencies. Of course, we haven't solved any infrastructural problem if we, uh, if we have this, this uh, uh, energy harvesting in, in the Sahara. And so here comes the first question of storage and then transportation. Storage and transportation are connected. And of course, we wouldn't be doing it this way. One would distribute things, and we would certainly generate electricity from solar radiation also in other parts of the world. But this tells you it's a doable thing. Now, what are the conversion technologies? Before I move to the question of storage, transportation, I apologize for the next slide. I'm only showing it to show you the source of the slide, because it's an extremely crowded slide, but one of the, for me, at least most often used resources uh, I, I have. I show it for this reference here. It's, it's the solar cell efficiency chart, which is published by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory of the US, and it's updated basically constantly. And you can, for all the different solar cell technologies, see what the efficiencies of solar cells are, which tells you the, oops, there we went too far, the best solar cells are at already 45% efficiency. So 45% of the radiation is converted to electricity. This is tremendous, I would say. This is not on the market as, uh, this is research cells, but still. There is one thing I want to mention. Uh, most curves are rather 
flat. But we have surprises, and this tells you how important science is in this field. There is a line beginning in 2000, uh, on this chart, 2012 approximately. This is this yellow line here. These are the perovskite solar cells, which have been invented less than 10 years ago, and which are now already at more than 20% uh, efficiency, which is on the same order as commercial modules. Research cells, of course, they're not very stable yet, they contain lead, which is a problem, but still, we have discoveries which really change the landscape quite substantially, and this is what many of us can be contributing to, and I think should be contributing to, to find better technologies. Currently, commercial modules which you buy and put on your roof have efficiency, I would say, around 20%, which is also quite... Uh, quite good, considering that for a silicon solar cell, the Schottky-Kweiser limit is at something like 32%. So there, there is still room for improvement, but not too much. And overall, we have an installed capacity. I found the number for the end of 2018, 46 gigawatt. The power consumption of the Germany is on the order, electricity consumption of Germany, power, is on the order of 75 gigawatts. So if all the solar cells are in operation, we have two-thirds of our electricity needs covered. That's the one technology comes in as electricity, which we cannot properly store, and I'll come back to that later. The second technology we have is wind power. The older ones in the audience may remember in the 80s we had the project Grovian, the Große Windenergieanlage, that's what it was called. At that time, a fantastic project. People thought it was totally silly. It was actually, some people claim, designed to fail, to show that wind power would not work. Grovian was way smaller than the current standard wind turbines we have implemented. So on land, the typical turbines have five megawatt power, or the bigger ones, the typical ones may more at three and a half megawatts, but the big ones, 126 meters rotor diameter offshore, they're sometimes even bigger. The biggest one, 9.5 megawatts, 164 meters rotor diameter. If we look at the installed power, 60 gigawatt. Now, if you take the 40, what was it, 46 gigawatts plus 60, we're at 106 gigawatts, which is more than the average power consumption of Germany. So if the wind is completely blowing and all the turbines are turning and the sun is shining, which rarely happens, I should say, then we do have more than we need. And we have either to switch down or regulate down turbines and, and solar cells or we, we have to do uh, export, basically. Now the big problem, and I already alluded to it, the big problem is the following. Downloaded the data from the 50 hertz, that's one of our grid operators in Germany, for March of last year, 2018. This is March last year. This is wind power in the grid, and 50 hertz is the eastern states of Germany plus Hamburg. That's what's covered by the 50 hertz uh, utility company. You see that wind power fluctuates between 12 gigawatts. That's about 10 nuclear power plants of the biggest size and zero, and sometimes in a matter of a few hours. So a grid has to cope with these kinds of fluctuation. And then we have the sun. There is, of course, the daily cycle. So in the night there is nothing, in the day there is something. But some days are cloudy, some days are sunny. And so sometimes you have a lot, sometimes you don't have a lot. In ideal cases, this compensates, like here. Lots of wind, little sun, uh, so there was probably a front going through. But sometimes, like uh, here, no wind, no sun. Foggy days, which we often have in November, and an electricity system has to cope with such a situation. And there is many ways to do it. Uh, which, which I will, will tell you about in a second, but storage is one option. Now, going one slide back, this is an interesting slide. 
because it is a very recent study Fraunhofer ISE did in Freiburg on levelized cost of electricity. And we always have the notion, at least I often had the notion, well, renewables are really expensive compared to other technologies. Uh, here is ranges for different technologies, renewables and fossil technologies. This is photovoltaics utility scale for solar irradiation in Germany, 950 to 1300 gigawatt, uh, kilowatt hours per square meter in year is, is a German situation. And Germany is, as many may know, not a very favored sun region in the world. There is one US state, I looked it up, there is one US state who, which has less solar irradiation than Germany, which is Alaska. <laughs> so we, we are not very favored. But even in Germany, with the 950 to 30, 1300 kilowatt hours per square meter in year, costs can come down to four, let's say, four to six euro cents per kilowatt hour, which is not, that, that's generation cost. It's not what you pay. I'm sure you all know you pay much more. But this is just the generation cost of the electricity. Wind onshore in favored location goes in about the same range. And the only fossil technology which is roughly in the same region is brown coal. Because that's a very cheap fuel and uh, that can cope with, with the... the, the even for German situation with the renewables. This is an important one, gas, because it's very flexible and can quickly switch on and off to uh, balance the fluctuating renewable energy. But gas is very important because the gas itself is exp uh, very expensive, because the gas is itself is expensive and because these machines only run 500 to 2,000 hours per year because you only need them for balancing power and not for constant power. So the investment costs are very difficult to bring in again. So it is currently borderline or, or sometimes even cost competitive uh, with respect to the kilowatt hour cost. Now, how do we cope with fluctuating uh, energy supply, which we have from renewables? The first idea is grid extension. If we had a global grid, well, there would always be some place in the world where the sun is shining, some place in the world where the wind is blowing, and if we have high voltage uh, direct current power lines, we can actually transport electricity with relatively little loss could even be possible to transport it from China to Europe if the Russians would allow to build the power lines. And we had this problem. You may remember the discussion about Desert Tech where the plan was to generate electricity in the Sahara, transport it to Central Europe, and building power lines through France, Spain, uh, North Africa was one of the problems in, in uh, making the vision uh, come true. So having this global electricity grid is still a question. And it only works for direct current. The, our current system is an alternate current system, and the losses in an alternate current system are too high to have a really long distance electricity transport. But technically, it could be done. This is more a political question, actually, whether one can do it. But it would be one way to mitigate the problem. The second way, backup capacity gas-fired power plants, which you can easily switch on and off, uh, decommissioned brown coal-fired plants, which you just let sit and restart if you need them. The problem is if you really put them out of service, you cannot just turn a switch and it's up to full capacity again. It takes quite a while to restart them, and so it's difficult to cope with changes in renewable energy which change on an hourly time scale. But still, you can do something with backup capacity. Then there is demand side management. Just shift the needs for electricity. If you have an electric car, well, 
you can charge it overnight, you can charge it when it's parked at your working place, wherever. And this is something you can use to shift loads depending on availability of electricity. And finally, storage is an option. This was the title page of a DFG Forschung. That's the inside of the gasometer in, uh, in uh, um, Duisburg beautiful place for exhibitions, and here was an installation of Christo and Jean-Claude. They put a wall, put up a wall of, uh, I think it was 14,000 oil drums, very high in the gasometer in the inside, and I thought it was very symbolic for the energy change because the gasometer, the big one, was an energy storage unit. The oil drums were energy storage uh, vessels. Both of them are obsolete by now, so we have to have something else. So storage is certainly a good option. One slide about demand side management, because it may trigger some thoughts. We are producing chlorine in Germany, 4 million tons per year. That corresponds to one really big brown coal-fired power plant. It's about 1,000 megawatt electrical power we need. And so if this production would follow availability of electricity, this could have a very balancing effect on our electricity system. Uh, the problem is it's often not economical. If your capital expenditure to build your plant is high, then you want it run all the time and not switch it on and off. And often these plants are not designed for being switched on and off easily. But I think one should do that and absurdly maybe electrify more plants in the industry, make them more flexible, just in order to provide balancing load in the system to cope with the changing uh, electricity supply. But let's come to the question of really large-scale storage to cope with these fluctuations in the system. And this is a plot I made a few years ago where I put typical size scales and typical time scales of storage systems uh, in one plot. And these are only rough uh, boundaries here. Very short times, relatively small scales, <coughs> capacitors or supercapacitors. Flywheels are also interesting. They are typically used for frequency and, and um, phase stabilization in electricity grids. So they have their function already nowadays. This is typically the field where it comes to mobility. If I drive a car, if I fly a plane, I have to pack energy into my vehicle, into my plane to bring me to my destination. And these are typically the technologies which are being used on grid scale for really large amounts for long times of storage. I will focus on these areas here in the energy system, but I just want to show that also capacitors, which are typically for short time scales, relatively low amounts of energy, can be interesting for storage of energy on, on, with system relevance. Let's put it like this. This is the picture of a bus which has run at the Expo in Shanghai in 2010. This is a bus which doesn't have a motor, internal combustion engine, it has a super cap and an electromotor. And the way it works is approximately like these little cars I had when I was a kid. There was a, was a spring inside, you ran them backwards and then you let go and they would go for, I don't know, 10 meters. They do the same with a supercapacitor. They go to the stop, to the bus stop. At the bus stop, there is electricity. They lift their conductors to the electricity, a superconductor can be charged extremely fast with high power, so they charge the capacitor, and then there is enough energy stored to reach the next bus stop, which is 500 meters away. There you have another conductor, you pick up more electricity for your next little stretch, and this system works, and it has been implemented in, in many, uh, well, many, in several other cities, for local transportation. So you are not linked to a cable all the time. You just charge your capacitor, run, recharge, run, recharge, run. So even technologies where you would think this, this is not useful, 
with system relevance, they can be useful with relevance for the overall energy system. But now let's come to the grid scale storage first, and then I will say a few words about mobility. Grid scale storage currently is done with pumped hydro. In times where you have enough electricity, you have a pump which brings water from a lower reservoir to a higher reservoir. If you need the energy back, you let the water run through the a generator, which can actually be the pump in, in reverse direction, and regenerate electricity. Pretty good efficiency, 70% between pumping and release but you need to change the landscape quite dramatically. This is Goldestal, where they basically cut off the top of a mountain to make room for the reservoir, uh, and, and there is a lower lake, which you cannot see on the, on the image, where uh, the water flows into when you let it out of the reservoir again. You could think this is a new idea of storing electricity. These plants are around for quite a long time, and actually, I found a quote from Leibniz, uh, 1680, only the Germans can appreciate this quote. He had the very same idea. Man kann die Kraft des Windes sparen und gleichsam in Vorrat legen. Solch ist es zu verstehen, wenn man damit Wasser in die Teiche bringt, welches darin in Vorrat gehalten und danach zu gemeinem Nutzen des Bergwerks auf Künste und Buchwerke dispensiert wird. This, that, that's the idea of a pumped hydro storage system which already Leibniz had about 350 years ago. Uh, technology is totally mature. The big problem which we currently have, first of all in Germany, we don't have sites for pumped hydro again because you need to change the landscape and people won't allow that. Second problem, storage density is not very high. I come to that. And third problem, all storage absurdly are not competitive currently because uh, electricity storage lives from differences between prices at demand times and surplus times. This used to be pretty high, this span. When we had our brown coal-fired plants, nuclear power plants, there was lots of electricity during the night, little electricity during the day, and prices differed strongly. Now, with less nuclear and brown coal and much solar, which brings electricity during the day, this spread has gone. And so storage is not economical, absolutely. It's clear that we need storage in the future. Currently, it's not a business case. And many plants which had been planned for pumped hydro have actually been abandoned because the economies are not there. I refer to the second problem. I mean, you're a physicist. The energy, potential energy, is amalgam uh, M times G times H. Goldistal, that's the biggest German one, this one here, has about 12 million cubic meters. They fall 350 meters. That gives us 41.2 terajoules. We have a total demand energy, not electricity, one should say. Electricity is roughly one third of 12.9 exajoules. So Goldistal has 0.00032% of the German energy consumption. So even if we had many of these plants, it would be difficult to make a big difference and store seasonally in, in these kinds of, uh, of pumped hydropower plants. The second problem, uh, changes in the landscape, can be addressed by a different technology, which is compressed air storage. You basically have subterranean caverns, typically in a salt uh, uh, formation in the ground, hundred thousands of cubic meters. In times of cheap electricity, you compress air into these chambers. And in times of expensive electricity, you release the air and either combine them in a, in a gas turbine with methane, which you charge instead of a turbocharger, or where you just directly run it through a turbine, you regenerate the electricity. If it's not adiabatic, the air heats up, and if you don't, when, when compressing, if you don't recover this energy, this is not a very, very um, efficient technology. 
about 45% efficiency. But if you recuperate the heat, you can get up to 70% efficiency. There are two plants in the world. One is in Huntorf in, in uh, Lower Saxony. The other is in the US in McIntosh. There was supposed to be a third one in Thuringia. Has been abandoned this plan because the business case is not there anymore because the spread between night and day electricity prices, prices has gone. It was an experimental plant, commercial plant has never been built. But it's a technology which you can use for storage, which does not change the landscape because everything you see above ground is essentially the same as in a regular power plant. So the, the big reservoir is, is underground. So the storage density you would need for grid scale storage is best achieved in, in chemical compounds. And hydrogen is the most direct uh, storage compound you could generate, has an energy density of 120 megajoules per kilogram, which is a lot. Diesel fuel, which is also very dense, has about 44 megajoules per kilogram. So hydrogen weight-wise has approximately uh, three times the energy density of diesel fuel. And you can generate hydrogen in an electrolyzer. You just put electricity or voltage uh, across two conductors, stick them into water, either under alkaline or acidic conditions, and you bubble oxygen and hydrogen. Proven technology, alkaline is mature. You can buy them off the shelf in really big sizes, the plants, up to 1,000 cubic meters of hydrogen per hour off the shelf, uh, they cannot be run under pressure and they cannot easily follow loads. Typically, you have to run them at uh, uh, the same power all the time. And so in, for balancing of power, this is not the best technology. The polyelectrolyte membrane fuel cells, which work under acidic conditions, are much better for that. They can operate between 500 and 300, 5 and 300 percent of their nominal rating. And that's very quickly. So they can follow demand and load cycles easily. And so this would be the technology uh, of the future for grid scale hydrogen production by electrolysis. Uh, you can also get them, but at lower, about 50 cubic meter per hour size scale. But this is a field of, of strong development. This is how they roughly look like. Uh, we have either alkaline or acidic conditions. The reactions at the electrode look a bit different, but essentially they are the same. Water is split in hydrogen and oxygen in both cases. It's just somewhat different technology, somewhat different catalysts. Here, this is normal transition metals, nickel, steel, cobalt. Here the catalysts are iridium, platinum, which tells you here is room for cost and, and technology improvement because platinum and iridium are really expensive elements. Um, another side remark, room for research. We are in all these electrolyzers, we are producing oxygen. The oxygen evolution reactions is, is technically and scientifically the biggest challenge. It's the most difficult one. It's four electrons transferred. It's difficult to evolve the oxygen. And then we throw the oxygen away. We release the oxygen into the atmosphere. We are only interested in the hydrogen. And so for people working on electrocatalysts and electrochemistry, I think it's a great opportunity to find other anode reactions where we don't produce oxygen, but something which is valuable, which you can sell afterwards and not produce something which we release in the atmosphere and essentially throw away. You could say, well, we are improving the quality of the air if we have a bit more oxygen. It doesn't make a difference on the global scale anyway. So here is room for improvement. What would you do then with the hydrogen? Well, the simplest thing, if you don't want to convert further, you store it in salt caverns just as the compressed air in the compressed air power plants. And this is already done at technical scale as hydrogen reservoirs in the connection with, with the um, refinery sites. In Texas, there is the so-called Clemens Dome that has approximately 600,000 cubic meters volume in a salt dome, pressurized 200 bars, a leak rate of only 
0.01 percent per year. So this is a tight reservoir, and you can store the hydrogen essentially for unlimited periods of time uh, under these conditions. So th this is a way to store it. Problem is, electrolysis hydrogen is currently really, really expensive. And so again, we don't have a business case to produce it. Hydrogen by natural gas reforming, which is produced on site, that's meant by captive, you don't have distribution infrastructure, costs approximately a euro per kilogram. Hydrogen from electrolysis, depending on what study you look at, is between three and up to 10 euros per kilogram. So nobody would do that if you have to earn money. You can actually ask yourself, how cheap does electricity need to be to be a business case? And I have done a back of an envelope calculation here just to give you a feeling. Thermodynamically, you need 33 kilowatt hours to produce a kilogram of hydrogen electricity. Practically, you need more, let's say 50 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. Industrially, a kilogram of hydrogen costs an euro. If you just calculate electricity costs, if you want to have 50 kilowatt hours and produce for a euro, it, doesn't, it can't be more expensive than two euro cents. And that doesn't factor in the capex of your electrolyzer. You have your electrolyzer running for free. So that gives you the target which you roughly have to achieve to be competitive for the production of renewable hydrogen to compete with natural gas steam reforming. But there is good news. In Saudi Arabia, there was recently a bid for a power plant, one by a supplier who offered photovoltaic electricity at 2.34 kilowatt cents, euro cents per kilowatt hour for a power plant to erect it in the Saudi Arabian desert, which is in this range here. So if you have an electrolyzer, you are in the right ballpark. And so what one could essentially do is you could produce hydrogen by electrolysis in the Sahara at two euro cents, hydrogenate CO2 to some fuel, and then use the current infrastructure of hydrocarbon transportation around the globe to bring it to Europe. Still science fiction. No, well, it's not science fiction. It's business fiction. The science would work. It's just not a business case, but it could develop into a business case. There are not orders of magnitude we are talking about. It, it's on the horizon that uh, it could work. You just need the carbon source because hydrogen is difficult to transport, but there are even ideas how to capture the carbon. Th this is from this paper here. It's a rendering. This is not a true plant, but this is the rendering in this paper you would have in the, in the desert. You would just flow air through an absorber and then capture the CO2 from the air. It's essentially you, you produce limestone uh, from lime. You produce limestone and concentrate the CO2 and then run it into a chemical plant. Don't want to go into the details here. And then when you have CO2, you can do something which is illustrated by this image, this photograph. This is uh, from our institute, Christmas party 1919. <laughs> and there is two important people on there. This is Franz Fischer and this is Hans Tropsch. And some of you may heard about the Fischer-Tropsch process, which converts essentially any carbon source to extremely high-quality diesel fuel. And that's the technology you could use in the desert. So you would take any carbon source. If you have CO2, you need hydrogen, you produce CO. And from that, you get the CO hydrogen mixture, the so-called synthesis gas. And synthesis gas is called synthesis gas by chemists because you can produce essentially anything from synthesis gas with the right catalyst, the right reactions. Fischer and Tropsch did this reaction, CO plus two hydrogen gives CH2X plus water. And you have seen this CH2X before. That's oil, essentially. That's hydrocarbons, liquid hydrocarbons. And there is nowadays a plant in Qatar which produces the syngas, however, from natural gas, not from hydrogen and CO2 from the air, that produces 12 million tons per year synthetic hydrocarbons by this process. So this is doable on really large technical scale. If you don't want to make Fischer-Tropsch fuels, 
You could do dimethyl ether, oligomethylene ethers, methanol. There are different transport and storage molecules, all liquid, all very high energy densities of 20 megajoules per kilogram. Just want to give you a brief impression what a catalyst does in this reaction. This is, a, this is an artist's rendering based on scientific facts. I got this from Rutger van Santen, who, who allowed me to show this movie. This is the fischer tropsch reaction. You have the hydrogen atoms, you have carbon monoxide. This is a ruthenium particle, and this is a bad ruthenium particle because it just produces methane, which is bad because typically you make the synthesis gas from methane and you regenerate it. If your ruthenium particles are big enough so that there are sites which look like this, these hollow sites, then suddenly you have hydrocarbon chains growing out of here. And when they have reached a certain length, they desorb, and these hydrocarbon chains are essentially diesel fuel. And this is how such a catalyst makes diesel fuel. It, it just produces straight chain hydrocarbons. The diesel fuel is of such high quality, low sulfur concentrations, very good combustion properties. If you have bad diesel with a lot of sulfur, which doesn't mean spe meet specifications, you mix it with fischer tropsch diesel, and then your sulfur concentration drops below the, the, the allowed limits. So and we're working on improving these catalysts also for small-scale plants. And with this, we are away from the grid-scale storage to actually traction, to the mobility sector, which is one-third of the energy system. We also need to run that on renewable and store energy. Well, what's the time? Because this one doesn't run out there. <laughs> it makes it difficult for me. Um, there is a reason why we use hydrocarbons for storing energy in a car because we need low volume, low weight for driving the car. And so for 500 kilometer driving range, we have 40 kilograms, 46 liters system, which is good. If you do that with hydrogen, the hydrogen itself is very little, but you need a tank which weighs 125 kilograms, has 260 liters. If you do it with a lithium battery, well, you're at two thirds of a ton or, or almost a ton and two-thirds of a cubic meter difficult in a car. Although in the early days of cars, electric cars were a competition. Until about 2025, uh, 1925, electric cars and internal combustion cars were competing with each other. The first car to run 100 kilometers per hour was a lead-acid battery-driven car, this one here. La Jamais Contente, French car, first one to go faster than 100 kilometers per hour. And up to 20, 25, uh, 1925, the competition was undecided. And then, according to our cooperation partner, Uli Oeberle from, from Opel, there was a single invention which changed the picture. And the single invention, he says, was the electric starter. Cranking the internal combustion engines was such a pain that people rather put up with the problems of a battery. When the electric starter was invented, batteries were blown out of the water. Nowadays, batteries are coming back. The problem is the energy density is only 200 watt hours per kilogram in a typical battery. And the problem is we cannot get much better if we have, as long as we have the lithium cobalt oxide intercalation electrode here, which is 50% of the weight. If it's 50% of the weight, you can improve every other compound component as much as you want to, you still have a lot of weight. And the problem is we store the very light lithium at seven grams per mole, which carries the energy, in a matrix of cobalt oxide, which weighs 100 grams per mole, or iron phosphate, again, 100 grams per mole. So we carry a lot of dead weight. So as long as we need this intercalation electrode, we are stuck. We won't get much better with respect to energy density. So we have to convert to totally new battery technologies. This is lithium ion with the intercalation electrodes. You need pure metal batteries, either zinc, air, lithium, sulfur, lithium, air batteries, where you get rid of this high amount of dead weight and get ahead with energy density. And then we can drive ranges which are long enough to be competitive with an internal combustion engine. I jump over this. 
is battery storage good for storing electricity on grid scale? Well, I showed you the levelized cost analysis. If you combine the PV rooftop with a battery, a lithium ion or whatever battery, it gets way more expensive. So currently, battery storage on the grid scale, even on your local scale, is not a good technology. Uh, heat storage is underexplored. I don't want to go into detail, but heat storage could couple sectors. Uh, and with that, I come to the final remarks. The problem is we don't have business models. Storage is not cost effective currently because we have lost the spread. But in 2040, we will need storage and will probably be chemical storage. E-fuels, making fuels from hydrogen, electricity, via CO, CO2 hydrogenation, could bridge the gap until full e-mobility. But then we have the problem, you build a plant for only 10 to 20 years. And then your capex is not brought back in. You have a problem. So one way is retain some liquid fuel infrastructure generated in sun rich regions, like in North Africa, transported with current infrastructure to Northern Europe. But the international framework is questionable, I would say. Take home message, our energy system is changes. It will be more electrical. We strongly reduce CO2 emissions. I think this is a trend which we see. We need to manage the fluctuating supply, supply and storage is one option. Grid scale, I think we have compressed air, we have pumped hydro, but on the grid scale, I think only chemical compounds have the storage densities which would allow them to be used. Mobility, we will maybe have a mix between e-fuels, hydrogen, and battery, and we should explore more converting electricity to heat and storing heat because we can store heat for a month and nothing is cheaper than a hot water boiler. So that, that's a very cheap system for changing energy. Two last remarks because I don't want to forget my Caterham Kensio. We are living in areas with a very well-developed grid and electricity infrastructure. Not the whole world is like this. Most of the world actually doesn't have a grid with reliable electricity, so storage may be even more important in these regions, and small-scale storage may be more valuable for countries where there is only two hours of reliable electricity per day. And the very final one is th this one. We shouldn't extrapolate linearly into the future. All of us may be working on disruptive technology, and cities, transportation systems, heating systems as we have them today may be totally obsolete and may be totally altered on a systems basis in the future. And so don't think linearly, be prepared and work on revolutionary solutions and not just incremental ones. With this I want to finish. Thank you very much.